Praise the Lord. You are clapping like the remnant of the clapping you did before. We thank God for those melodious voices. I will pray that the Lord will bless everyone, both the melodious voices, the owners I mean, and then all of us who are enjoying the ministration that all of us are bringing to you during this time in Jesus' name. You know that we have uh, four sessions. We have today, we have tomorrow, we have Monday, and we have Tuesday. And they are all linked together to bring us to the gracious and the glorious power of the Lord in ministry and in our profession. And I pray that all these sessions you make yourself available and heaven will pour down blessings upon your life, your family, your ministry, and your profession in Jesus' name. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you at this time and bless your name. We glorify you because we know you are God. You have called us. You have recreated us. And you have put us in ministry in our profession so that your work will prosper in our hands. We are praying, oh Lord, you confirm your grace in every life, your power in every life. And you will do unprecedented work in every life and minister and in every professional in Jesus name thank you Lord because we know you have answered we pray that this session you speak to every heart and every heart will receive everything you have for every one of us in Jesus name thank you Lord it's done in Jesus name we pray I would have expected a greater amen. God bless you. You can sit down. As we begin the series of messages and ministrations that the Lord himself has prepared for us at this time, I'm coming with the message from Romans chapter 12, and I'm reading from verse 1. Romans chapter 12, we're reading from verse 1. It says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And then he tells us in verse 2, in verse 2 it says, And be not conformed to this world in your mind, in your thinking, in your lifestyle, in your practice, in everything you do, in church, outside the church, in the marketplace, in your profession. Anywhere you find yourself, and whatever it is the Lord has called you to do, it says, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. That's what salvation does. Be ye transformed. That's what the grace of God in our lives, that's what the grace does. And be ye transformed. That's what connection with Christ, that's what it does in our lives. Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Look at verse 3 there. In verse 3, it tells us, it says, For I say, through the grace given unto me, that every man, to every man that is among you, among us, believers and ministers and workers and professionals who are connected with the Lord, it says that we should not think more than we ought to think, but think soberly according as God has dealt to every man. Notice that he has dealt to every man. He has given to every man. He has provided for every man the measure of grace. The measure of grace. Actually, he also gives us the measure of faith and the measure of grace and the measure of power. That's why this morning we're looking at the message 
partakers of the same measure of grace. The same grace that saved Paul the Apostle. That the same grace that has saved every one of us. And the same kind of faith that they manifested for salvation and for sanctification and for service is the same grace available today and the same measure of power that makes us to live a victorious life and overcoming life is the same measure of power that makes us succeed and be and victorious today and so when looking at the message partakers of the same measure of grace and power as faith. And I'm dividing the message to three parts. Number one, we're looking at the possessors of the same measure of faith. Faith available in Christ, the author and the finisher of our faith. And when we come to God, he gives us that faith. The gift of faith so that we can enter into the manifold possession, manifold provision of the grace of God. And then he also gives us the same measure of grace. And so number two will be partakers of the same measure of grace. Number three will be the proclaimers of the same measure of power. Very simple, faith the same measure grace the same measure and power the same measure and we become possessors we become partakers we become proclaimers let's look at number one here number one we're looking at possessors of the same measure of faith possessors of the same measure of faith begin to think in your mind that every, everything he wants you to do everything he wants you to accomplish every everywhere he wants you to go what it takes is faith in god by faith enoch by faith noah by faith abel by faith abraham by faith sarah by faith isaac by faith we're told about jacob by faith we're told of all those heroes of faith in hebrews chapter 11 they did different things but they had the measure that made them accomplish what the Lord had given them and called them to. And so we're thinking now, and we're looking at the word of God now, what, what is he that can make me a possessor, a partaker? What is he that can make me to have that same measure of faith? We're looking at Romans again, chapter 12, and we're looking at verse 3. It says, For I say, through the grace given unto me to every man, look at that, you included me, included everyone, included to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly. And to think that when we say soberly, it means we're not excited by uh, the nature of pride. We're humble and we size up ourselves and we know that without him, faith in him, connection with him, we're nothing but with him. As we think soberly, as we think scripturally, as we seek by the provision, the message of the word of God unto us, we're thinking soberly scripturally according as God has dealt, has given to every man the measure of faith. And then we're looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and we're reading from verse 13. And you'll see what it mentions here in particular. It says, we have been the same spirit of faith. We, you are born again, you are a child of God, and you have your right in the family of God, and you have your calling into the family of God. It says, we have, you and I, we as children of God, individually as members of the family of God. It says we have in the same spirit of faith. Accord, 
according as it is written. According as it is written, I believed, and therefore have I spoken. We also believe, and therefore speak. We also believe. The same measure of faith. Let me break that down for you to three sections. Number one, number one, men and women of the same measure of faith. Men and women. The same measure of faith, boys and girls in the same family having the provision of daddy and mommy. And so we, in the family of God, it says both men and women will have the same measure of faith. Number two, ministers and workers. We're ministers, whatever our title, from the apostle to the prophet to the evangelist to the pastor to the teacher, ministers of every description, and workers, the workers who are supporting those ministers in ministry in the church. It says, ministers and workers of similar manifestation of faith. Think about that, that the faith I have the faith a worker can have, the faith the leaders have, the faith the followers can have, that ministers and workers in the vineyard of the Lord, ministers and workers in the ministry that God has given us, either in the church or in the ministry, in the profession, we have similar manifestation of faith. Number three, miracles and wonders by sanctified ministers of faith. Ministers of faith who are totally devoted to the Lord and God had worked on the inside of them and their lives are very different from what they used to do or what they used to be because now they are set apart unto God. They are made holy by God. They are sanctified by God. God, we have miracles and wonders by those ministers of faith. Pick them up one by one. Number one, men and women of the same measure of faith. Men and women of the same measure of faith. Let me show you a man, and then I show you a woman. And as you look at Jesus interacting with them and commenting on their faith, the man, the woman, had the same measure of faith. And today, the men and the women, the women as well as the men can have the same measure of faith. Look at Matthew chapter 8, and I'm reading from verse 8. We're looking at a man here. In Matthew chapter 8, verse 8, the centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof. But speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. Here is a man, it's not even an exalted man, it's a man like you and I, ordinary, and was coming to the Lord for the first time. He wanted healing, he wanted deliverance for his servant. And the Lord said, I will come and I will heal him. Oh, you said, you don't have to take all the trouble. You don't have to come, walk in, and get into my house. Stay here and speak the word without any touch and without any laying of hands. Just speak the word here. After all, that's how our Heavenly Father created the whole universe. And so he says, speak the word and my servant shall be healed. Look at verse 9. In verse 9, for I am a man, like you, like me, a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this man, go. And he goeth. I don't have to touch him. 
I don't have to push him. I don't have to, you know, speak with a kind of hysterical voice. I just speak with the natural voice. And he hears that word I have spoken, not with a special colored, tailored, manipulated minister's voice, just normal voice. I tell my servant, go. And he goeth, and I tell him, come, and he cometh, and to my servant, do this, normal voice, normal voice, not shouting, and he doeth it. Look at verse 10, here is the comment of Christ, here is the evaluation of the face of the man, and we can have the same faith, it says, when Jesus had each he marveled and said unto them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. That was his measure of faith, a man. Let's look now at Matthew chapter, 20, Matthew chapter 15, reading from verse 25. Then came she, there's a woman now, and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. Look at verse 26. In verse 26, but he answered and said, it is not meat. It is not suitable. It is not right. It is not acceptable. It is not me to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs and now in verse 27 and she the woman said truth lord i'll accept anything you say if any man said that to me i will not accept if anyone called me dog unworthy i will not accept but because you are lord and i take you now as my lord i accept you now as my lord Whatever you say to me, whatever you say about me, whatever you say concerning me, truth, Lord, I accept that. That means I'm not worthy to have the children's bread. Yes, I accept. Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. And I take you now as my master. Let some crumbs fall from the table where the children are eating. And that's enough, that's enough to heal my daughter that is grievously vexed of the devil. Now in verse 28, verse 28, then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great. Is thy faith? My point is, he said that same word to the centurion, a man. I've not found so great faith, not, not in Israel. And he's saying the same thing to a woman. Great is thy faith. Hold on. Everything we get from God, we get by faith. Salvation, by faith. The man, the woman can have that same measure of, of faith and our salvation, sanctification, holiness of heart, holiness of life by faith. The marriage, your marriage, the single, the man, the woman, born again, can be sanctified by faith. It doesn't have to belong to a particular denomination. It doesn't have to come from the same church in nomenclature, in name. It doesn't have to come from the same background. The man, the woman can have the same measure of faith 
and be sanctified. The power of the Holy Ghost. Ye shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, and you'll be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, and to the uttermost part of the earth. The man in the first century, and the man in this century, by faith, it's all by faith, it can have the same power, the same uh, that uh, goes for the woman. The woman, sure, by faith can have that immersion, that baptism, the power of the Holy Ghost because it is by the same measure of faith. Our healing, we can have healing, is by faith. Do you believe I can do this? Yes, Lord. A man can reply like that. Do you believe? Yes, Lord. A woman can reply like that. Yes, Lord. The same measure of faith available for us to be healed or to be delivered. You have a kind of a stubborn a, a spirit that is tormenting, torturing, and vexing you, your life. And you say, what am I going to do? Remember, the same faith, the same level, the same measure that healed other people and destroyed the works of the devil in their lives before, the man, the woman can have the same measure of faith. Well, if I can have the same measure of faith, then I can possess, I can have the same thing that other people had by that faith. You're not reaching up. It's not like, what am I going to do? My problems are too great. Faith will remove the mountain. And what the other men in the past, the women in the past, what they got, I can get, you can get, and you will get today. I said you will get today. So then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith be each unto thee as thou wilt be each unto thee as thou wilt and the daughter was made whole from that very hour and uh, let's come now to number two here number two ministers and workers similar of similar manifestation of faith ministers and workers you see in the early church they had those ministers up there and then they had the workers that had been chosen to support and to help the work they were doing we're looking at uh, acts chapter 3 and i'm reading from verse 6 acts chapter 3 verse 6 the peter said silver and gold have i none Hold on. We think if we don't have silver and gold, it's finished for us. We think if we don't have financiers who can support us financially, we'll never move forward. We think if we don't have silver and gold, we will be, if we have any ministry at all, we'll be at the back of the queue. But you see, faith is greater than all that. The material things, the tangible things, the contacts and the connections, and the people we know, the people we don't know, the money we have, the money we don't have. And then Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have. I give thee, there are people that don't uh, ever know or make use of what they have because they're all the time pursuing what they don't have. I don't have this, I don't have this. What do you have? What do you have? Such as I have. You have Christ, and you said you had nothing. You have God, and you said you have nothing. You have the promises of God, and you said you have nothing. You have the name, the name of Jesus, and at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will give unto you. And you have the word, the never failing word of God, and you have the concrete word of God in your life. What, what I don't have, forget about that. Watch do you have? Do you have faith in God? Do you have total reliance upon God? And do you have total dependence on God? 
talk about what you have, not what you don't have. He tells us there, he says, and Peter says, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give I thee in the name. Thank God I have the name. I say, thank God I have the name. Say that now. That name will work in your life. It will work in your ministry. If you believe that name, if you stand in that name, if you stand for that name, that's what you need. It says, but such as I have, I give unto thee in the name of Jesus, of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Of course, it happened. The devil cannot hinder whatever you demand in the name of Jesus. Look at verse 16. Verse 16 tells us, and his name, not the voice of Peter, and his name, not the constitution of people. You know, he is different from who I am because of his constitution, because of his makeup, because of his Christmas. No, it is the faith we have in the name. And Peter was a minister. Peter was an apostle. And he said, and his name through faith in his name, in his name has made the this man strong, whom ye see and know, yea, the faith which is by him has made, has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. That's the measure of faith for a minister. Let's see now of a worker, a worker. We're looking at uh, Acts chapter H, and I'm reading from verse 5. Acts chapter 8, verse 5. Then Philip, one of the deacons, meant to serve food to uh, the, uh, the people that needed food in the church. Just a server, just a worker. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them and then in verse 6 it tells us it says and the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which philip spake hearing and seeing the miracles which he did how did he do that in the name of of Jesus, the name of Jesus in the mouth of the apostle, and the name of Jesus in the mouth of the deacon, of the server of food. It works the same way because we have a similar manifestation of faith, whether it's an apostle or it's just a worker. Look at verse 7. In verse 7, it says, for unclean spirits, crying with loud voice came out of many, not only one person, not only, only one demonized person, out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies, and that were lame. The same miracle. The same power, the same manifestation of faith. Do you remember Peter saying to that man, a lame man? And do you see Philip saying to a lame man, and they were healed? Not only one, then in verse 8, in verse 8 were told, and there was great joy in that city. The point is, the same faith in men and women. The same measure of faith, manifestation of faith in ministers and workers. That same faith will produce miracles and wonders. Come to number three here. Number three, miracles and wonders by sanctified ministers of faith. Sanctified ministers of faith. Faith. Remember, salvation by faith, sanctification by faith, 
We don't have to relocate to another church, another assembly, another ministry before we can be sanctified. Those people, they emphasize sanctification so their members are sanctified. You too emphasize the same thing. Emphasize the scriptures. Emphasize what God himself has demanded. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. And if you say the same thing and believe the same thing and expect the same thing, the same salvation you'll have, the salvation God that gives us victory over sin. The sanctification that gives us victory over self and the power that gives us victory over suffering and over anything that Satan may conjure up in any life. Number three here, miracles and wonders by sanctified ministers of faith. It will come through you. You will walk wonders. When you mention the name of Jesus, and you understand, we have access to the same measure of faith. We have access to the same manifestations of faith. We have access to the same, the same ministry of faith. We're looking at Isaiah chapter 8, and I'm reading from verse 18. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 18. Behold I and the children whom God, whom the Lord has given me, are for signs and wonders in Israel. That's a prophet saying, I, but not, but not only I, and the children that God has given me. And Christ could say that because we become his followers, his disciples, his children. Remember, Christ is the eternal God. And we, when we come to faith and we have salvation, we become members of the family of God. And Christ could say, Behold, I. And the children whom the Lord, the Father, has given me were for signs and wonders in the nation, in every nation, from the Lord of hosts, which dwelleth in Mount Zion. And believing that as you take what the Lord has given you, even though you had never heard it like that before, the wonders of God will be coming through your ministry and through your life and through everything connected with you in Jesus' name. Look at Hebrews chapter 2 and I'm reading from verse 11. Hebrews chapter 2, we're reading from verse 11. It says, "Both for both he that sanctifies, that's referring to Christ, he sanctifies, and they who are sanctified, that's referring to sanctified believers, are all of one, are all of one. For which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Verse 12, in verse 12 it says, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church, I will sing praise unto thee. Look at verse 13 now. In verse 13, and again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children which God has given me. It's quoting I said that were read in chapter 8. Behold, I am the children whom God, the Lord, has given me. We are for wonders, for signs, signs and wonders in our nation. In your nation, signs and wonders. 
power manifestation through your ministry in Jesus' name. Now we have number one that we have dealt with now, men and women, the same measure of faith. Ministers and workers, the same manifestation of faith and miracles and wonders by sanctified ministers of faith. I say amen for your life in Jesus' name. Let's look at number two now. We're spoken about faith, the same measure of faith. Now we're talking about grace, partakers of the same measure of grace. Think about that grace, 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 grace that is greater than all my sin. Grace that is greater than all my shortcomings. Faith, grace that is greater than all my suffering. Grace that is greater than all my challenges. He gives us faith. And if those other people, if they overcame, if they were victorious because of the grace they had, we can have the same measure of grace. It tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, reading from verse 15. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, reading from verse 15. For all things are for your sakes. All things that Calvary provided are for your sakes. All things that come from God through Christ are for your sakes. All things promised by God through Jesus Christ are for your sakes. For all things are for your sakes. That the abundant grace might through thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. The people of old and those who had victory, they couldn't have anything more than abundance of grace. And those of us who are here now, it says, we can have that same abundance of grace. It will come into your life. It will flow into your life. Now, partakers of the same measure of grace. Let's divide that to three parts so we can understand very well. Number one is the impartial provider of the same measure of grace. The impartial provider of the same measure of grace. Number two, the importunate prayer for sufficient measure of grace, sufficient measure of grace, and we're importunate as we're asking him. Number three, the imperative perseverance in the sustaining measure of grace. What does grace do in our, in our lives? That same measure of grace and the sufficient measure of grace and the sustaining measure of grace. Let's look at number one. Number one, the impartial provider of the same measure of grace. In Ephesians chapter 4, reading from verse 7, but unto every one of us, unto every one of us, unto you, unto her, unto him, unto every one of us, it says, is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Gift is not something I earn. Gift is not something I work for. Gift is not something I labored for. We have the grace because of the measure of the gift of Christ. 
and he is impartial. What is given to the other, because of his impartiality, he gives to me, he gives to you, he gives to everyone, but unto every one of us, thank God, I have the same measure of grace today. I expect you to say it yourself, thank God, praise God, I have the same measure of grace in every situation. Amen. Amen. To every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of God. And let's look at Titus chapter 2. And I'm reading from verse 11. Titus, uh, Titus chapter 2, verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men the grace of god that bringeth salvation has appeared unto how many people all men read that again for the grace of god that bringeth sufficiency sufficiency of what i need sufficiency of everything I need to be an overcomer for the grace of God that bringeth strength has appeared unto all men is the grace of God that strengthens us from within you know sometimes a person feels tired and he feels fat out he feels I cannot take another step but remember that the grace of God is giving to everyone the same measure of grace for the grace of God that bringeth strength has appeared unto all men. Remember that in our weakness, in our nothingness, it is the grace that builds us up and makes us be what we ought to be. For the grace of God that bring a full salvation has appeared unto all men. Look at verse 12. In verse 12, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly laws, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. In verse 13, it says, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. In verse 14, it says, who gave himself for us. Who gave himself for us. How did Paul do? All that he did, Christ gave himself for Paul. How did Peter achieve, overcome everything he achieved, everything he overcame? Christ gave himself for Peter. All those early believers in the early church, how did they have the victory, the triumph? And the conquering power that they had, Christ gave himself for each of them. And they realized that. They knew, in my strength, I might be nothing. They knew, in my experience, I might be a failure. They knew, in my kind of exercising whatever I have, I may not succeed. But they knew, to make up for your weakness. And to make up for your insufficiency, Christ gave himself for you. If you realize that, and because he gave himself for you, whatever level of grace you need, it is provided in Jesus' name. Who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity. That gives the lie to the people that say, I've overcome this sin. I've overcome this iniquity. I've overcome this kind 
of uh, temptation, but looks like he's peculiar to me. This is the but in my life. Don't say that again. That he might redeem me from all iniquity. He has the same grace available. You know, somebody says compulsive stealing is my challenge. You can't say that again because he now redeems us from all iniquity. Somebody says, I'm a believer and I'm, you know, I have the faith and the grace that overcomes. But this adultery of a sin is my besetting sin. I try, I fast, I struggle, I even punish myself, but adultery, fornication is the besetting sin. Don't say that again. Are you telling me that the blood of Jesus and the grace of Jesus and the power we have in Christ cannot crush, cancel, and give you the overcoming authority over fornication and adultery because you know he says Christ gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people. <laughs> Here somebody says, that preacher is peculiar. I'm not going to try to be like him. Be like Christ, you'll be as peculiar as he is. That proclaimer of the word is peculiar, and I cannot run side by side with him. Don't say that again. Everyone that comes to Christ, he makes them so peculiar, they will run with the strength they never had before in Jesus' name. They will have the victory they never had before in Jesus' name. Why? The same measure of grace he has, you can have. The same measure of sufficient grace that he has, you can have. And I declare to you this morning, greater grace in your life. Greater faith in your life. And everything that puts your back on the ground before, this morning, you will rise up and look at that thing and say, now come, now come, I will overcome. Amen. You will overcome because we have access to the same measure of grace. And he tells us in that verse 14, who gave himself for us, that he, Christ, might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. It has started in your life already. We're looking at number two there. We're looking at the importunate prayer for sufficient measure of grace. If we know we don't have sufficient, yes, we have grace. We have grace to overcome those initial, initial challenges that came in our lives. Now, we're moving on. And as we get to this new level of ministry, it looks like the grace we add in days gone by, years gone by, it looks like this present level that God has called you now, you need greater grace and we need to pray. But the point is there are people that pray and they pray for five minutes and they are gone. They've left the throne of grace. They're not asking anymore. 
And then they go to the field. And the challenges that come to them, they are higher, greater, mightier than what they had in the, at the original level. Now, they don't have sufficient grace. They say either the Lord has not called me to this new level because I don't have the grace to occupy the position or I'm the one that is just making up the vision. I'm trying to bring some drive into my life and the thing is not working and they slide back to the old level. You'll come to the higher level. All we need to do is to say like Jacob, I will not let you go except you bless me. This challenge is higher than the grace I have. And this calling is greater than the grace. I, I could manage that and that and that. But this one now, I cannot manage. You'll not only manage, you'll be victorious in Jesus' name. Because you will have importunate praying for sufficient measure of grace. We're looking at 2 Corinthians, reading from chapter 3 and verse 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 5, not that we're sufficient of ourselves, to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. Go to him, he'll make you sufficient. He'll make the grace of God sufficient in your life. Look at verse 18. In verse 18, but we all, that's it, we all, you and I, we and them, everyone believing in the Lord, we all with open face beholding us in a glass. The glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory as by the Spirit of the Lord. If I prayed for five minutes and sufficient grace has not come, stay there. Why do you go to the market? You should get something particular. And you have not got it, stay there. Look around, search until you get the reason why you went to the market. Why did you go to pray to have sufficient grace? Have you got to eat? No. Stay there. Pray. Ask. Demand. Be importunate. That's the reason you want to pray. It's not just to pray. You want to pray so you can have sufficient grace for everything you need for your ministry, for your life, for your family today. Stay there and have sufficient grace before you rise up. Elijah, what are you doing there? I'm praying. What are you praying for? I'm praying for rain. Are you not tired? You are there and you've been there for a long time now. And you sent your servant, go and see. The servant came back. I saw nothing. He kept on praying. He didn't rise up there. Go again the second time. And the fellow went. Have you seen what I'm asking for? Not yet. He kept on praying. Go again. Go again. Until seven times. Why are we so much in hurry? By the way, when you are praying, and you prayed for some minutes, and you have not got what you wanted, then you get up, and then you are talking to this and this and that. I'm asking you, is that talk, that conversation, is that interaction greater than what you are asking for? No, sir. Why are you substituting the less for the better? Go back there and do like Jacob. The angel said, let me go for the day breaketh. 
I've been wrestling all night for your sin. I wanted a special blessing because I have special predicament. And you want to go, and I've not got the reason why I was praying. I will not let you go, except you bless me. Here is Paul, the apostle, the messenger of Satan, buffeted him. And stronger Paul cried out to God, this is too much. If this continues, I will not be able to finish my ministry. He prayed once, no answer. Second time, no answer. He did not quit. We need the problem solved. We need the grace sufficient. And then he prayed again the third time. And then the voice came up. Now you have the grace and my grace is sufficient for you. That is the time you say, praise the Lord. I cannot get up and go and do what I'm supposed to do. Most people pray too little before the answer comes. And before the grace becomes sufficient in their lives. But we'll keep on in importunate prayer until that answer comes. It will come. In your life, it will come. The grace of God you'll find will be sufficient for you in Jesus' name. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 4, and I'm reading from verse 16. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We're looking at number three now. Number three is the imperative perseverance in the sustaining measure of grace. Sustaining measure of grace. You see grace, there are people that limit grace to the time of salvation. But grace is supposed to go through and run through the whole of our lives. In temptation, as for grace. In trial, as for grace. In challenges, as for grace. In difficulty, as for grace. In confusion, as for grace. In failure and backsliding. As for grace, in a tough situation in your life, when a mountain confronts you and it appears you cannot tunnel through and you cannot go through and you cannot go over and you cannot go around and the mountain stops you still at that point. All we need is grace and the grace of God will sustain our lives in Jesus' name. Look at Hebrews chapter 10. I'm reading from verse 37. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 37. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. He that shall come will come and he will not tarry. Amen. Amen. I know primarily, primarily, that refers to the coming of the Lord. We've been waiting for him. And he that shall come will come. And he will not tarry. Good. Right. Proper. Good interpretation. Here is Elijah again. is praying. He's praying for the Lord to bring the blessing. He has prayed, he has prayed. And the famine of three and a half years has not come to an end. Fire 
came down from heaven after the fire we need the re the water the deluge of water that will come from heaven he prayed and prayed and prayed it has not happened yet a little while send that servant out again and he that shall come the refreshing that will come the refresher that will come the bringer of the rain of the water that will stop the famine in the nation it says he that will come will come will not tarry look at this friend that went to uh, the friend's house friend let me three loose there because i have <clears throat> another friend that has come and i have nothing to give him and the fellow said over there i'm in bed already and my children are with me do i turn back i have the need at home i still have nothing in my hand stay there because yet a little while and he that shall come shall come out of that house he'll come out of that house and will not tarry and you will have everything that you need look at the children of israel going around jericho walls for those jericho walls to fall and they went the first day and they went around the second day and the walls were as still strong and high and steep and permanent as they were and then they went on again and went on again on the seventh day they went seven times why are we so tired so soon we prayed the first day. We went on the second day and the third day. Now we are tired. And the person that shall come from heaven and blow down those Jericho walls, he has not come. Don't give up because yet a little while and he that shall come will come. He will not tarry. I almost gave up for years i prayed and prayed and prayed i wanted the power the power of the holy ghost that will make me fulfill all that i needed to fulfill and i had friends they didn't have that kind of goal i had friends fellow believers they didn't have that kind of consecration and drive and they just went and they prayed and they were filled with the Holy Ghost, baptized with the Holy Ghost, and they spoke in tongues. And they'll come and tell me they wanted to kneel by my side and be praying by my side and be speaking in tongues so that I will catch up. I said, Hold it. I'm not looking for speaking in tongues, I'm looking for power the power that will bulldoze everything before me and crush all the power of the devil i'm not i'm not uh, looking for copycat speaking in tongues i said hold that one and i kept on praying and it says for yet a little while he that shall come will come and will not tarry what are you praying for don't give up I didn't give up. I didn't give up. I didn't quit. I wasn't discouraged. Why? Why has the Lord not given me what I was looking for? Then I learned when you plant maize, it comes up very quickly. When you plant cocoa seeds, that takes longer time. I realized I was planting cocoa seed. I was not planting maize. And the people that just got it and got it and got it, and all they wanted was to be able to say, I spoke in tongues. Their maize came up in less than six months. But cocoa seed has more value than your corn. Am I right? Stay there. 
Don't give up. It will come. The power, it will come. The glory, it will come. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Look at verse 38. In verse 38, now, the just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. Number one, the just justified by the salvation of the Lord. The just shall live by faith. Number two, the just called into service and ministry to face Pharaoh. And he went, Pharaoh said, get out of my sight. The next time you see me, you lose your life. But by faith, by faith, you went back again. You will go back to that same place you failed before. The just shall live by faith. They were at the Red Sea. The just shall live. Already he lived in Egypt. Pharaoh couldn't crush him. Already he lived on that final day when they came out. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. They are now out of Egypt. But there's no water to drink. The just shall live by faith. And then uh, there were serpents, snakes in the wilderness, killing people, destroying people. The just shall live by faith. They were now, they were the Red Sea. They were to pass over because if you are drowned in the Red Sea, how can you live? If you're going to pass through that Red Sea of a problem and you're going to come to the other side, the just shall live by faith. The Amalekites met them on the way. And the Amalekites in their army, they were stronger than the little army you sent out with Joshua. The just shall live by faith. What I'm pointing out is, it is not only at the point of salvation. Yes, at the point of salvation, we're justified by faith. But as you move on and on, there will be things that will confront you. And the just, the justified in the kingdom of God will have to remember, wait a minute, I have the same measure of faith as the heroes of old that they had. Now, the just shall lay by faith, but if any man draw back, that's what the children of Israel were trying to do. Look at Pharaoh, look at the chariots. They wanted to go back to Egypt. If any man draw back and look at it, we don't have any water to drink, and the water we have found now is bitter. This is Mara. What are we going to do? Don't we have to go back to Egypt if any man draw back? And look at the challenges of the confederacies of the Canaanites. And they, they were always thinking, you see, those who cannot pray for sufficient grace in their lives, all they can think about is, look at my mountain, I want to go back. Look at my challenge, I want to go back. Look at my persecution. I want to go back now. The just shall live by faith. But if any man, any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Before we were saved, he had pleasure in us. That's why he brought the gospel to us and we received the gospel. When we were saved, we became peculiar children of God with the sanctification. And because we're peculiarly attached unto him, he had pleasure in us. But if any man draw back, my challenge is too much if I draw back. The temptation is too high. 
my flesh is demanding something that if I give my flesh the pleasure, sinful pleasure, it has, I know my, my body, my flesh will keep quiet or be silent, but then I would have drawn back. And if you draw back, draw back to sin, draw back to the old life, draw back to old Egypt and draw back to the pleasure of the flesh. If any man, any man, whatever is a kind of bold face, whatever is bragging, whatever is pride, whatever is position, if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. And if God has no pleasure in you because you've drawn back privately and you've gone to satisfy the flesh instead of satisfying our Heavenly Father and heaven does not have any pleasure in you going about and smiling and laughing and bragging and giving this testimony, that testimony is worthless, it's nothing. What you need is that you'll come back to the Lord so that your life will be washed again, cleaned up again. Your life and your faith and the grace in you will be refreshed again. And then the Lord will have pleasure in you. Look at verse 39. In verse 39, but we are not of them who draw back unto perdition. We're not going back to that same Egypt. We're not going back to the old life. We're not of them. Faith available. Grace available. The goodness of God and the provision of God available. But we're not of them who draw back unto perdition. But of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Somebody will say amen over there. Amen. We're coming to point number three now. Point number three, proclaimers with the same measure of power. Proclaimers, preachers, proclaimers, those who declare the word of God with the same measure of power. Think along with me. The world in which Peter, John, James, the apostles ministered and lived, the population was very small. Now, the world in which we live the world in which we minister, the population is much, much higher. Think again. The people that the apostles, Peter, James, John, Paul, that they ministered to, they didn't have too much sophistication in sinners. Yes, they were sinners, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The world will minister to, there is sophistication in crime, sophistication in occultism, sophistication in evil, in satanism, much more than the world that those apostles minister to. The people that Paul, Peter, and the rest of the apostles ministered to, they were much, much limited in spreading sinful ideology. If, if they were going to make another person do something bad, something evil, they had to literally walk to those other people to talk to them and to influence them. And how many people could they talk to? How many people could one sinner influence in those days in the world in which we live? 
the perpetrators of evil and the corruptors of other people, uh, they have more gadgets in their hands they can use to influence. A criminal can influence somebody a thousand miles away from where he is by all the gadgets he can use. The point is, the challenges are greater now. The challenges are higher now for proclaimers of the gospel. Can we have less power when we have greater challenge and greater problem than those early apostles and then hope to overcome, hope to have the victory and the triumph in the time, in the life, in the world in which we live, that those other apostles 2,000 years ago that they had, we need, if we don't have a higher power, we need the same measure of power. You agree with that? And here you are, you are born in this place, at this time, in this generation. If they had that power, conquering power, that made them to go to all their world and evangelize their world, we need the same power. That's why we're looking at proclaimers of the same measure of power. What will I have? I will have. Romans chapter 15, verse 19. In Romans chapter 15, verse 19, through mighty signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, by the power of the Spirit of God, Paul the Apostle was saying, he had the breakthrough in ministry, not because it was of dual nationality, not because of the mastery of language, not because of the native natural power he had. He said all that other people also had, but he didn't have the breakthrough in ministry. He said what made him to be beyond all the other people is the power of the Spirit of God. So that from Jerusalem and round about unto Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. The same power for you and for everyone today in Jesus' name. We're looking at three things here. Number one, we're looking at mighty prophets with the same measure of power. Number two, meaningful partnership with the same motive and purpose. Number three, Mature people with the same mind and pursuit. Look at number one there. Mighty prophets with the same measure of power. Well, the reference in Deuteronomy chapter 34, that talks about Moses. Joshua chapter 10 that talks about Joshua. Luke chapter 24, verse 19, that talks about Christ. And Romans chapter 15, verse 19, that talks about Paul. Take them one by one. Moses, look at the power he had in Egypt, in the wilderness until he passed on. Now look at Joshua. Joshua, suppose Joshua said, I don't need the same power as Moses had because there's no Pharaoh now, but the Canaanites were there. 
I don't need the same power that Moses had because we're not crossing the Red Sea now, but Joshua, we need to cross River Jordan. I don't need the same power because I am not Moses, but you are Joshua. Joshua had a greater challenge to confront. He had the challenge of circumcising all those thousands, if not millions of people that were born in the wilderness. You need power to convince those Israelites that should be done, even at this time. And then Moses had one Egypt to conquer. And Joshua had a confederacy of nations to conquer. Moses had to divide the sea. Joshua had to stop the sun. Don't ever say, because I'm not Moses, I don't need the same measure of power. Because I am not Joshua, I don't need the same measure of power. As you come to the New Testament and see Paul, the apostle, all those nations, all the people he went to, they were deep idol worshippers. And the children of Israel were great adamant, stubborn traditionalists. And to be able to conquer the mountain of tradition and the mountain of idolatry in all those places, he needed the same measure of power. Today, as God has called us, the things that confront us, the ministry we exercise, we need that same measure of power. He will give it to you. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1, verse 8, it says, but he shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. The Holy Ghost will come upon you. Where you could not go before, you'll go there. What you could not do before, you will do with that same measure of power. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. We're coming to number two. Number two here, meaningful partnership with the same motive and purpose. The same motive and purpose. What's our motive to fulfill the great commission? What's our plan? What's our purpose to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature? Any other reason for partnership? That's much less. Partnership for numbers. That's much less. Partnership, so we can have a unified voice to speak to the government. That is much less. The purpose and the motive for partnership is so that in our bringing power together, in our coupling our strength together, we may go to the world and fulfill the calling of Christ has given to the church. John chapter 17, verse 21. In John chapter 17, reading from verse 21, that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us. Partnership, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me, that the purpose for the partnership, and that is a meaningful partnership that will bring our resources together, our talents together, our gifts together, and will bring the manpower, everything together, and drive 
to the field where we're rich sinners and they'll come to know the Lord. We're looking at number three. Number three, we're looking at mature people with the same mind and pursuit. The same mind and pursuit. A renewed mind. A refreshed mind. A, re a reconstructed, recreated mind. And a righteous mind. And then pursuit. We're pursuing that goal. We're pursuing in the field with the gospel to reach out to the people we need to reach out to. But we must be matured, matured people. We're not sitting down arguing on non-essentials. We're not sitting down instead of fighting the devil. We're fighting the other church, the other denomination, a fruitless fight. And it doesn't have the mind to fulfill the calling the Lord had given to the church. Matured people that can overlook non-essentials. Matured people that can overlook what is of personal, personal idea, personal ideology. But to take the watch of God, the message of life, the message of the gospel and team together and partner together and go forth into the field and get so saved into the kingdom of God. It will happen. It is happening already. We're looking at, looking at Romans chapter 15 verse 5. It says now the God of patience and consolation grants you to be like-minded one toward another. According to Christ Jesus. Look at verse 6. In verse 6, that she may with one mind. Ye may with one mind. We're not diverted. We're not distracted. We have one mind. And one pursuit, it says that they may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The people don't have the same mind. They're full of questions. Why this? Why that? Why allow this? Why don't you allow that? They're full of criticism. They're not contributing. They fold their hands. They hide their talents. They're just there looking at the people who are running the race. The Lord said, relax. Don't fold your hand. Don't close your eyes. Think of the mind of Christ and the mind of the people who are going from place to place and see what is missing. Don't say that is missing. Rise up and contribute what is missing and have the same mind and the same pursuit and we will win the world for Christ in Jesus' name. I want to bring a contrast here in Revelation chapter 17. Revelation chapter 17. I said it's a contrast because it's not talking about the church. It's talking about the people that believe in another leader. What they do to have their own purpose and their own pursuit. In Revelation chapter 17 verse 13. And it says these have one mind. And shall give their power and strength unto the beast. It will be at the time of the great tribulation. All the powers in the world, they will have one mind. They want to a kind of um, take away the mind of the world away from Christ. And they want to serve the Antichrist. And they have one mind. And they shall give their power. 
they shall give their substance. They shall give all the possibilities of whatever they can do and their strength unto the beast. Look at verse 14. In verse 14, these shall make war with the Lamb. These shall make war. They'll unite. They'll have one mind. They'll have one goal. They'll have one purpose. They'll have one pursuit. And the motive is that they will make war with the Lamb. If the enemies of the gospel will forget the color of the skin, they'll forget the differences in language and culture, they forget all the things that would have separated them. And yet, they'll give all their strength, all their power, all their activity, everything they have, they'll give it to just one purpose, to fight the land. And they are fighting a fight that they will be defeated. And the Lamb shall overcome them. For he is... Lord of lords and king of kings and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. If the enemies of the cross, the enemies of the gospel, the enemies of salvation, the enemies of Christ, if they have the same mind, the same pursuit, and they never give up, I about the people of God, the children of God, the ministers of God, the leaders in various denominations of the church. Yes, we have some differences in this and that, but we're united in Christ the Savior. We're united in God the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. We're united in the fact that without Christ, no one can be saved. We're united that except somebody is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Stay on that unity. Magnify that unity. Walk on that unity. Come together in partnership in that unity and go forth and win the lost to Christ. It will be done. In our generation, it will be done. With you and I and the rest of us, it will be done in Jesus' name. The same measure of faith. The same measure of grace, the same measure of power, and we're ready to take the world for Christ. Are you there? Would you agree with that? Why don't you rise up then and say, Lord, this is our time. The same faith, the same measure of grace, the same measure of power. Whatever we need to forsake, forsake them. Backsliding, sin, anything that will hinder your progress, our progress in this calling the Lord has given us. Repent of them. And say, Lord, here am I. Lord, here am I. Lord, here am I. Forget anything that hinders us, anything that stops us, anything that will make us fall or fail. Rise up and do the work the Lord has called us to do. Yours, the same faith. Yours, available for you, the same grace. Yours, ready provided for you the same power. Talk to the Lord impartial. Talk to the Lord with importunate prayer. Talk to the Lord with perseverance. And the Lord will give you everything that is needed so that we'll be one with all the people of God and we will win the day.